Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current version of my Sunday sermon. It might change, especially this one. Christian Reformed Church in Synod 2022, that will be June 22, 2022, will take up a report that has been postponed for two years because we haven't had synods because of COVID in two years. And that's sometimes called the Human Sexuality Report which was written by um, it's a synodical committee that wrote pastoral care guidelines and wisdom for uh, dealing with the variety of changes in the country with respect to uh, issues concerning human sexuality. Uh, there is, in fact, a group in Grand Rapids called All One Body that has started making videos um, promoting change in the denomination. And even though you might not hear a lot of talk about this in terms of churches in our classes or right here now, this is a big deal, as you might expect, given all of the change in our culture over the last couple of decades. Now, while many of us might find these changes unsettling or difficult or not quite know what to do, these kinds of conflicts within the history of Christianity are normal. The church almost always has issues that there is conflict over. In fact, in what I think is quite a good book entitled Heresy by English scholar and historian Alistair McGrath, right from the start, these issues have engulfed the church. We've been talking about one that we're going to continue to talk about one in terms of the Apostle Paul and the debate over circumcision. For example, Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. But what to think and do about Jesus of Nazareth? How to regard him? Uh, Jesus is Lord was a saying of the early church. What did they mean by that? Well, eventually in succeeding centuries came theological statements regarding the doctrine of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God. Um, three persons, one God. The divinity of Christ. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Later on, after the persecution in the Roman Empire, when numbers of priests uh, defected and denied their Lord under pain of persecution, the church had a big controversy called the Donatist controversy as to whether or not such priests who betrayed their faith under duress should be, la should be let back in as priests. Uh, many people said no. Some people said yes. The yeses eventually won. The, donat the, donat the Donatist church is no more. It's partly because the persecutions ended. Now, We've been spending a number of weeks talking about what was a defining controversy at the very earliest stages of the church. And in some ways, the entire book of Acts is about this controversy, as is the entire book of Galatians. It's a controversy we don't think hardly anything of. One of the things that's difficult for us to think about the fact is that there are near there are zero Old Testament texts that seem to anticipate the setting aside of circumcision. Um, the question that many had was, will trusting in the Spirit really be enough so that the church doesn't simply get consumed by the far broader pagan world and its practices? And a few weeks ago, we talked about what I called the spiritual multi-factor authentication that Luke sort of walks through in Acts chapter 15. But there have been many controversies like this throughout the history of the church. Can Christians be bankers? Now, when I say that, some of you will think, well, that's kind of a crazy question. I know Christians who are bankers. In the Middle Ages, however, Jews were the bankers because Christians were not allowed to lend money to other Christians with interests. So in many cases, um, monarchies and countries kept Jewish bankers around, but this also led to certain degrees of anti-Semitism because if you owe the banker a lot of money, how happy do you feel about your banker? 
You like them when you're looking for money and you don't tend to like them when you have to pay it back. That's sort of the way banking works. John Calvin comes around and offers a theological justification for Christians lending other Christians money at interest. And you know what? That, along with a number of other factors, was instrumental in the rise of modern capitalism. Without that theological argumentation, I don't know that you'd have had a car loan or a home loan, even though both of those kinds of loans sort of stretch the justification that John Calvin gave. John Calvin basically said, it's permissible to lend money at interest to other Christians if, in fact, the purpose of the loan is to earn more money. You're just splitting a share of the profits. And it isn't permissible if you're going to lend money at interest for basic necessities, basically reading Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. How many of us think about that today? No one. It's The idea is simply gone. Now, this fight in the Christian Reformed Church, which has gone on among Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, at this point may very well end the Christian Reformed Church as we know it as a denomination. I don't know how much it will impact um, many of the local churches or our particular classes, but in Grand Rapids, it's a very big deal. Uh, those who wish to see the CRC rules change, um, it's pretty clear they don't have the votes at Synod to pass the kinds of policies or changes they want. And so one church in Grand Rapids in particular um, announced sort of their path to give a test case. And in some ways, this dares the denomination to try to discipline them. Well, they're pretty smart because on one hand, people might disagree, but deciding to kick off or sever a classis or a church is a much weightier thing. So those of us who keep track of denominational politics know that this fight has been going on in the Reformed Church of America, a sister denomination of ours, or in some ways a mother denomination. This has been going on for decades, and it could very well be that this October in the Reformed Church of America that the denomination fractures. And in fact, that fracturing is already underway with the new creation of the creation of a new denomination called the Alliance of Reformed Churches that a number of Reformed Church of America churches are going to. And if this type of thing continues, there might be a reordering or a restructuring of churches, of churches into different denominations. None of this is fun. And when we look at questions such as human sexuality, we wonder, will it be like the Trinity? Will the church come to some kind of agreement on it and sort of many of the rest sort of go away? You can find Unitarian Christians of various stripes all over, but they're quite a minority compared to the Trinity. Will this be like lending at interest, something that people today don't think anything of? Most of us don't like conflict and want to avoid it whenever we can. We want to go about our business and do what's relevant to us. And if this particular issue isn't relevant, most people just don't want to weigh in on it. Now, the two passages we're going to look at today, back to back in the book of Acts, talk about some things that are, in fact, not terribly happy. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit, the, and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. They preached and they started groups in those towns and they want to go back and check up and see what's going on. No email, no Zoom. It's a very reasonable thing. Go back and encourage those churches. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. And you might remember that he had left them mid-journey last time. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Now, not a lot is said about why. Scholars, of course, in the silence have conjectured that it may in fact have been over this issue of circumcision, dietary laws. This was in many ways the big issue that we're going to see when we jump ahead a few chapters in the book of Acts. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And Paul and Barnabas, who Barnabas looked for Paul when he went to Antioch, 
Paul and Barnabas went on that missionary journey to Cyprus and to then to these places in Asia Minor. Paul and Barnabas then went back to Antioch and then Paul and Barnabas went to the Jerusalem Council. Barnabas was has been a early member of the church and an important leader and Paul and Barnabas can't agree and the disagreement is sharp enough that they part. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Now, one of the things we know is that Barnabas, in fact, was, I believe, a nephew. Or Mark was a nephew of Barnabas. So there was a family tie there. But Paul chose Silas. Silas, we mentioned, he was one of the people that took the letter of the Jerusalem Council up to the church of Antioch and read it there. Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, this is not the story we want to hear. We want to hear a story about Christians coming to agreement, even on something as practical as whether Mark can come or not. But that is, in fact, not what happened. Paul is not one to mince words, as we've seen. Um, to what degree did his personality and his personality conflicts with Barnabas? Barnabas was a peacemaker. Paul was not. Why did John Mark abandon them before? We don't know. There's conjecture that Mark was more conservative than Paul. John Mark is a cousin. I'm sorry, not a nephew, a cousin. That's why I write things down. Of Barnabas, John Mark might be the author of the Gospel of Mark and is associated with Peter, who, if we've got all the names right, and this is always kind of a slippery business, in 1 Peter refers to him as my son. So, a big help. Later, Paul, in fact, would reconcile with Mark, and that's good news. But was Mark uncomfortable with the fast developments with the Gentiles? Impossible to know. But they didn't see eye to eye. And even just this one little split tells us about the degree of hostility and anger. And a little bit later, we'll read about violence. These kinds of issues are very hot. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believer at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew in number daily. But this whole business with Timothy raises more flags. Now, Timothy will become sort of Paul's right-hand man. He will represent Paul and help with churches when Paul has to go elsewhere. Like John Mark um, and Peter, Paul will later call Timothy my son. And we have two letters in the New Testament that are that are first and second Timothy. Timothy was uncircumcised. Uh, Jews considered heredity going through the mother. Now, if you think about this, it's a pretty savvy move because almost always the way that you can commit genocide against the people is by killing the men and taking the women and having children with the women and then basically their line goes out. Well, in some ways, the Jews flipped the strip, script on them and said, well, we're going to consider um, our identity through the mother. And so Timothy was born of a Jewish mother, but a Greek father, and the father never decided to have the son circumcised. Now, in, the, in Greco-Roman culture, fathers had a tremendous amount of power and influence. But after all of this talk about circumcision, why does Paul circumcise Timothy? Well, that's a really good question. A lot of people have wondered. Paul seems to hold that the Jews and the Gentiles, there are two sets of expectations. Paul did not expect Gentiles to first become Jews in order to participate in the workings of God through Israel, through Christ. But Paul did expect Jews to continue to be Jews, even in Christ. And in many ways, this was what a lot of the conflict was about. Paul never imagined that the practices of observant Jews would be set aside for Jews. Because Timothy was a Jew by his mother, it was right for him to be circumcised, according to Paul. Paul in Jerusalem 
would be a Jew. How was Paul when he was in Antioch? Well, this was something that lingered in the minds of many. Now, this incident and many others set in motion a whole series of incidents. There's a lot of guessing. We don't know exactly when, but somewhere between 47 and 49 AD, Paul and Barnabas split up. Paul's last visit to Jerusalem that we have in the book of Acts is in 59 AD, so somewhere between 10 and 12 years, these two stories are separated. Now we're currently starting Acts chapter 16, and I'm going to read from Acts 21, because it emphasizes the nature of the conflict and just how hot it was. Paul's martyrdom happened in Rome between 65 and 66. Paul now travels to Jerusalem, as recorded in Acts 21. When he arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received him warmly. Next day, Paul and the rest of us, meaning Luke is with him, went to see James and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, Paul is being received by, well, like he said, the elders and those present, James and James and the elders and those present, which means that if we believe Luke in Luke 5, in Acts 15, that James was very much in favor of Paul's missionary work, but many in Jerusalem were not, as we're about to read. When they heard this, Paul's report about all of his missionary journeys, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. In other words, there's a deep division with respect to this issue still after James and the Jerusalem Council made their pronouncement. This line, probably the lines between all of this are, are quite fluid. They've been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses. Ah, now do you understand why he had Timothy circumcised? telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to their customs. As we've seen, Paul sort of had two tracks, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. What shall we do, they ask, because Paul coming to Jerusalem is, well, dangerous, sort of in the way that Jesus going to Jerusalem was. They will certainly hear that you have come, so, that what we, um, so do what we tell you. So now they're going to give him some advice. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Now, these are Jews, and they've made, a, they've made a vow, and they're going to fulfill this vow, and this is a very public thing. They want Paul to do something to demonstrate to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem and others in Jerusalem that Paul is, in fact, still understanding and complying with the laws of Moses himself as a Jew. So, take these men join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that there's no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. The next day Paul took the men, purified himself along with them, and he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So Paul, now in Jerusalem, is very publicly demonstrating to everyone that he continues to live by the dictates of the Mosaic Code. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Now why is that important? Well, where's the province of Asia? Well, this is where Paul has been ministering. This is where all the fights have happened. And it's quite clear that people are getting around quite well in the Roman Empire and that rumors are getting around and they very much have an idea about Paul's reputation. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. This is a very big deal. Now, 
some of you might remember all the way back to Acts 6 and the story of Stephen. This was the charge against Stephen, where Paul held the coats of those who had accused him. So in other words, Paul had taken a pretty dramatic turn in one direction. So they stirred up the people and the elders and teachers of the law, and they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Now you can see quite readily why Paul has been doing what he has been doing. Yet these arguments, these fights are dividing even people who have been friends and family members. And it's a terribly difficult, difficult thing. They had previously seen Trophinus, the Ephesian in the city, which Paul, with Paul, and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So, in other words, there was a false report, and they were acting on it. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some soldiers and officers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Now, it's a much longer story, and I'm not going to go into it. You can read it yourself um, later on if you wish, but I want you to get a sense of just how hot these issues were. And they weren't just hot within the church. They were hot between the church and the Jewish population that was continually trying to figure out how to live as a tiny minority out of step in the larger pagan world. And so these issues were very, very hot. And they led, in this case, to the arresting of Paul. He would, for the most part, remain in in one type of imprisonment We think, we don't really quite know if he was let out at one point, but he, of course, would be killed by Nero, the emperor, and he would die in chains. These are the stakes. This was the conflict. And by virtue of this conflict, for a very long time, a number of things were sorted out. It seems to be that this is the way we as human beings try to figure things out over the very long term. Why can't we just all get along? We try to, we sort of do, but then something happens and someone does something and, well, you know what conflict is. All of us have our ideas. How do we figure out the truth? The truth learns and grows, is purified and built up through difficult struggles over long periods of time. And we learn when to say yes, and when to say no. This has been the pattern right from the start. And even though in the midst of all sorts of things today, often these kinds of questions take centuries to get resolved one way or another. Yet, we still must talk about them. We still must work through them. We still try our best to do the right thing. We struggle to agree on what is right and wrong. This is normal. We are reliably unreliable. Pick your hero. Paul and Barnabas have their falling out. Peter denies Christ. Martin Luther approved of the brutal suppression of the peasant revolt and said a lot of very anti-Semitic things. Martin Luther King Jr. had a real problem with adultery. Pick your hero. Find an aspect of whether things change or don't change in history you will find flaws. You'll find many of our heroes on the wrong side of many issues at one time or another. Martyr means witness in Greek. It applies to individual saints, 
and to the church as a whole. We struggle together, we wrestle together, we work together, we argue together. Sometimes we divide, sometimes we split. Over long periods of time, we believe God reveals his word and his work and his will to us. Jesus himself modeled this in the context of the Judean culture war. He was a witness. One of the things that I often remind people is that when the Son of God came to this world, he was so unpopular, one of the few things that Romans and Jews, especially Jewish nationalists, could agree on was that the world would be better without Jesus. This is almost always the way things are. We would love to imagine that once we arrive at the right answer or rest on it, that everyone will agree with us and the conflict will go away. It's not how it worked with circumcision. It's not how it works with the conflicts we have today. Over long periods of time, they get settled, but this is our path. How are we then to live? We have to continue to seek the truth through what I call the spiritual multi-factor authentication. We look at God's revelation to us in Scripture. We look at and listen to the authorities of churches, and, and we look at the history of the church all the way on down until now. We look around and we see what does God seem to be doing here and now among the brothers and sisters that we see. And we take all of this, just as Paul and the Jerusalem Council did, and then we move forward. We should love our neighbors all the way up to and including our theological and church rivals. Are we separated by some issues? That doesn't release us from the command to love. We expect the very long revelation, painful purification of conflict. Conflict is, not, is seldom fun. It's often with us over one issue or another. We shouldn't be surprised by it. We trust in God's providential leading of his church as his bride. Yes, there are conflicts today. Yes, there is church schisms. Yes, there are splits. Yes, each of us have to decide via our conscience what is right and what is wrong and what we shall do. But it's finally not up to us. Our church belongs to our Lord and we trust him for the future. 